My Neighbor Totoro, a film that has captivated audiences and brought a sense of childlike wonder to people of all ages since 1988. One that critics and fans alike acclaimed for its groundbreaking presence in animation, breathtaking landscapes, beautiful music, and a lovable giant creature that has since made his way into the hearts of many. Today, I'd like to explore the magic of My Neighbor Totoro, how this one character became iconic and universally beloved by people from all walks of life globally. Let's start where I always do in my videos. I like to start with my history with the film so you understand the lens through which I see everything. So somehow I never saw My Neighbor Totoro as a kid. It wasn't until about five years ago I saw it in a Studio Ghibli Fest at the movie theater. And let me tell you, it was a interesting and unique experience to say the least. I saw it like in the middle of the day on a weekday and there was only one other person in the theater and they sat right next to me. And when I tell you they belly laughed at everything, I mean everything. Every time the girls in the movie laughed, every little quirky moment, they were laughing. And not only that, but watching this film in a modern movie theater is kind of an odd experience. I talk about in my other video, Miyazaki uses something called ma, right? Which is these calm, empty moments in the movie and they not only help build the story but they also give reprieve to all of the action and if he said in interviews that if you don't have this moment of quiet you can't appreciate the action but the thing that's wrong with that is these moments of quiet I could hear the action movie booming next door or the wind whistling in the theater or even at one point I think I could hear like the pop music playing in the credits of another movie. So it really broke my immersion. At that point, I put my neighbor Totoro to the side. I never really thought of it again until years later when I went through and I was watching Studio Ghibli movies in their original Japanese format. I love Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle, but I had never watched the original Japanese version, so I was going through all of them. It wasn't until watching in the original Japanese format that I understood I think I just don't like the dub of My Neighbor Totoro. The voice acting is very shrill. The little girls, Dakota and Elle Fanning, were seven and nine when recording, and they are actually sisters in real life, which is really cool, but the balance of the audio is just way off in the dub. Their voices are far too loud. In the Japanese version, the girls are played by adult women, and they're way more mellow sounding, even when they're screaming and laughing and having a good time it's still way more balanced with the rest of the audio. The original voice acting is so much better, and this is coming from someone who is absolutely not a subtitle snob. There are many anime shows and movies that I enjoy dubbed. With the majority of other Studio Ghibli movies, I feel that the dubs are exceptional and absolutely worth watching, but in this case, the voice acting of the little girls is so shrill and extremely loud in the dub, and it's not balanced with the other audio of the movie. The voice actresses of the original Japanese version are adult women, which is obviously very different, but it's extremely common for adults to play voices of children in movies and shows, so even when they're laughing and screaming joyfully in the movie, it has a much more mellow and balanced sound, which allowed me to enjoy the movie much more, and I was able to appreciate the charm, beauty, and distinct voice of this film. When I later learned the rich history behind the movie and the reasons behind the simplicity and how it was meant to be viewed, I'm now able to understand what makes it so special and why it's cherished by so many people. There is beauty in the simplicity and deep joy and sorrow to be felt when enjoying this movie, while soaking in the fantastical atmosphere brought to you by the ingenious art design and surreal soundtrack. The director of My Neighbor Totoro, Hayao Miyazaki, had been working for Studio Ghibli for three years at this point. He had already made two films prior to this one with the Studio Ghibli team, Nausicaa Valley of the Wind and Castle in the Sky. But this film was really special to him. He had been working on the concept of Totoro for 15 years leading up to the movie. It is what initially got him into the mindset of living life as an artist and getting out of his day-to-day -day job. He has said in interviews that he feels like his life was pointless and he wasn't living for anything. And at this time, he began to develop the concept of something more that he could do with his life. Initially, this was not the concept of animation, but the concept of writing children's books. 
He began drawing characters for My Neighbor Totoro with the idea of turning them into a children's book. At the time of creating the iconic bus stop scene, Miyazaki said that he had held the image in his mind for that scene for 13 years at that point. He has also said in interviews that the development of this concept helped him to appreciate his country and see the beauty of Japan, soaking in the Japanese landscapes and villages in the countryside for inspiration for his drawings. He frequently took walks around his neighborhood and the countryside for inspiration. He said that he had not appreciated the beauty of Japan before this experience, and it allowed him to appreciate it on a much deeper level, the elegance that was hiding within his own country the beauty that had been right in front of him all along. So beautiful, in fact, that he said many people have asked him if the setting in the movie was based off of their village, which means not only were his settings extremely relatable for people, but also there were just that many places in Japan that are that lovely and picturesque. When developing the movie, animators utilized new and innovative techniques with their cell animation to achieve things that had never been seen before in animation. Seemingly simple things like the rippling quality of the rain or the translucent appearance of Totoro's friends when they're running from May in the beginning of the movie. This was achieved by painstakingly removing parts of the cells to achieve that translucent quality. This was another idea that had been swimming around in the mind of Miyazaki for over 10 years. They also developed innovative techniques in their cell animation for the rippling water and rain, overlapping up to four colors to achieve the desired look. One animator said in an interview that the tadpole scene alone took them over a month due to these new methods to get the rippling and translucence just right. The art director Kazuo Oga became interested in the film when Miyazaki showed him an image of Totoro standing in a field similar to a rice paddy nestled at the foot of a hill. My Neighbor Totoro began Oga's career. Oga and Miyazaki debated on the film's color palette. Ogata wanted to paint the soil black from Akita Prefecture and Miyazaki preferred the color of red soil from the Kanto region. One of Studio Ghibli's producers described the final result of their collaboration as nature painted with translucent colors. A great part of the atmosphere in the movie comes from Oga's backgrounds, which gave each tree, field, and twist in the road a spirit as if it had been brought to life. Oga's work on My Neighbor Totoro was the first of many projects he did for Studio Ghibli. Pixar director John Lasseter has cited this style as an inspiration for the scenic and panoramic backgrounds in his movie Up. Speaking of Pixar, did you ever notice that there's a Totoro plush in Toy Story 3? There may be a good reason for that. Mei in My Neighbor Totoro is based on Miyazaki's niece, Mei Okuyama, and she went on to marry Dice Tsutsumi a Japanese animator and illustrator living in San Francisco, and a former art director of Pixar. This, along with Miyazaki's friendship with John Lasseter at Pixar, could be why Totoro makes such an unexpected cameo in this film. There is a lot of speculation as to why the initial promotional art for the movie displays only one girl standing at a bus stop with Totoro, and that girl is neither Mei or Satsuki. It's someone totally different. There are a myriad of conspiracy theories, including things about one or both of the girls being dead, or Totoro being the god of the dead, all kinds of stuff. But Miyazaki has said himself to dispel this rumor that the initial plan for the movie was to only have one female protagonist. However, they were struck with a difficult problem. When writing the bus stop scene, that one child would not be waiting alone at the bus stop for so long of a time, especially a very young child. If there was only one girl for the whole movie, she would have to be closer to May's age, so she would be home during the day and not go to school, so it would have to be a very small child that would not be waiting at a bus stop for hours on end for their dad. So they had to split one character into two, and that's how it became two sisters rather than one girl. Studio Ghibli had a difficult time securing funding for My Neighbor Totoro. Miyazaki stated that back then a story without a hero or a girl with superpowers and ordinary Japanese scenery as a backdrop would not be considered entertaining enough. And later he said entertainment back then was all about guns, action, and speed. I wanted my movie to be peaceful, tranquil, and innocent. 
I wanted to create that kind of world. Also, I wanted to prove that a movie like this could be successful. One creative way to sell the movie was to sell it as a double billing or double feature. This meant that two movies would be played together and the audience would get more bang for their buck. During this time throughout the world, the concept of double features was more popular, and this is part of the reason that My Neighbor Totoro has one of the shortest run times of any other Ghibli movie. It was meant to be viewed alongside another one. The other movie that it was meant to be viewed with is one of the saddest movies I have ever watched, hands down. The saddest and most meaningful Studio Ghibli movie. You see, at the same time, while Hayao Miyazaki and his team were creating My Neighbor Totoro, another member of Studio Ghibli, Aisao Takahata, and his team were working on Grave of the Fireflies. Grave of the Fireflies is a movie that depicts the horrors of war and the immense impact that it had on Japanese people. The movie follows an older brother and younger sister who have lost their family in the war. They're homeless and starving, just trying to survive. The big brother tries his best to be fun and assure his little sister's mind that everything will be okay, but when the sister falls ill, everything goes south very quickly. And let me tell you, I'm not sure I've ever cried that hard about a movie. Except maybe one other one. You see, we meaning millennial and Gen Z generation people, have a tendency to view World War II as ancient history. But in 1988, it was very recent history. The war had just ended in 1945, and within Miyazaki's lifetime, he remembers some of his earliest memories were running from bombs, and his father ran a warplane factory. He values peace so much more than those of us who have never endured the horrors of war and can't imagine. This is why the quiet moments and simplicity of My Neighbor Totoro are so loud. They speak volumes about the joy of peaceful times when juxtaposed to Grave of the Fireflies, where the main characters are going through literal hell on earth. Miyazaki said in interviews that he intended My Neighbor Totoro very specifically to be in the time of 1955 so it depicted the time right after the war, and the feeling of peace and tranquility. However, his team kind of lost sight of the time, and the movie appears to be slightly after that, but still falls into the category he wanted of recently post-war. This was also a time where tuberculosis was running rampant in Japan, and this is a time that Hayao Miyazaki himself lived through. The mother in the film is likely based on Miyazaki's own mother as she struggled with tuberculosis when he was a child. She was in and out of the hospital for many years, much like the mother we see in the film. During this time, tuberculosis was widespread and common, a very difficult problem for many Japanese people as the illness had a very long recovery time and was contagious, so people with the illness were often kept in separate areas from their families, just like the mom we see in the movie. My Neighbor Totoro also mirrors many other things in Miyazaki's life. He has said that the mother and father's characteristics are like those of his parents, and he's even gone as far to say that if the protagonists in the story had been two brothers rather than two sisters, it would have made it exceedingly difficult for him to write, as it would have been too close to being autobiographical. I talked about this in my Spirited Away video essay, but in case you missed it, here's a brief review of Shinto. Shintoism is a religion native to Japan in which followers believe that all things possess a spirit. People who practice Shinto are harmonious with nature and practice ancestor worship as they believe that their ancestor's spirit still inhabits the world. After a person dies, their spirit passes on into the afterlife, but is still here on earth with us. They also believe that even things such as forests, trees, rivers, and animals have spirits within them, and the spirits are called kami. Understanding Shinto is important, and understanding the symbolism leads to a deeper understanding of some of the main plot points that happen within My Neighbor Totoro. Totoro and his friends are forest spirits, or forest kami, that inhabit the giant camphor tree in the forest next to the house in My Neighbor Totoro. Camphor trees are significant because they can live for thousands of years and they grow to be massively enormous. They're native to Japan. They're also a beautiful 
powerful symbol for nature continuing to grow and remain the same while Japan was going through a dark and transformational time. Several symbols of the Shinto religion are displayed throughout the movie, including the rope around the camphor tree, the Tori gate, which is believed in Shinto to be a passage to the other side, to worship spirits and is often found outside of a shrine, the shrine at the top of the hill when they ascend the stairs to greet the forest spirits, and the shrine that they stop in at when taking shelter from the rain, where Satsuki bows to it and says, thank you, we need to borrow your roof for a while. During the iconic scene in which the girls are waiting at the bus stop for their dad, May wanders off a little too far and stumbles upon a shrine, with a shrine fox wearing a kerchief around his neck. The fox shrine is to the spirit or kami called Inari. Inari is a popular deity associated with foxes, rice, household well-being, and prosperity. It makes sense that it would be present in this village where they're farming rice. You can see within the shrine there is a place for shinzen or offerings of food and drink to the spirits. Prior to World War II, Shinto was widely practiced by most Japanese people and it was even mandated by the government at one time. Shinto is a way of life for Japanese people and it lent to a tremendous sense of community that Japanese people feel and continues to be prevalent in Japanese culture, the feeling of everyone bearing responsibility for the environment and the community. After World War II was over, there was a decrease in Shinto beliefs and an increase in Western culture and beliefs. Miyazaki has said in many interviews, and it's obvious throughout many of his movies, that he yearns for a pre-war Japan, Japan of the past, in which everyone was harmonious with nature and took the impact that they had on their environment very seriously, as well as living as a community and helping each other out. Living as a community is seen in the tight-knit relationships that are formed instantaneously when moving to a new place in this movie. This was a way of life in Old World Japan. Without question, all of the neighbors immediately help out when they think May is lost in the fields. And without a second thought, Granny has been taking care of this old abandoned house for years for probably no reason other than it needed to be done. She steps in and helps with childcare unblinkingly in the face of Satsuki and Mei needing a caretaker when their father is away at work. The boy, who is their neighbor, is characterized as being a troublemaker and not wanting to help people, but in the time of need, jumps in without question to help them. Another small sense of community is seen when Mei has a hard time leaving Satsuki, and she cries until Granny will bring her up to the school. Granny says that she won't stop crying until she can get to see her big sister. I think it's easy for all of us to imagine exactly what would have happened if that had happened in our schools growing up. They would have been sternly turned away at the door and refused access to the classroom. But what happens in this small village community? May is welcomed into the classroom to join them for the remainder of the day and sits happily drawing pictures of Totoro with crayons while the other students do their work. Another stark difference in the old Japanese world compared to life as we know it now, and I've heard this is still a thing in Japan, is that children are much less supervised because there's more of a sense of safety. Group reliance is a concept that Japanese kids learn early on, that ideally any member of the community can be called on to serve or help others. This assumption is reinforced in schools where children take turns cleaning, serving lunch, and instead of relying on the staff to perform these duties, they have to rely on one another. In the United States, and I'm sure many other countries, we wouldn't even consider allowing children to run into the forest or play on their own, walk to and from school or to the bus stop without supervision, out of fear that something terrible could happen to them. But here, in the community that's so tight-knit and close, there's a tremendous sense of safety in knowing that everyone is looking out for each other and they're left to their own devices. A good example of this is the first scene where Mei finds Totoro in the forest. Satsuki comes home from school and dad acts like he hasn't seen Mei for hours and has no clue where she's gone off to, but he never looks terribly worried about it. Let's talk about the spirits in My Neighbor Totoro. First, let's talk about the soot sprites. That's what I like to call them, but when doing my research and the comments on my Spirited Away video, I noticed something kind of funny, that everyone seems to have different names for them. Some of the names I saw were Black Soots, Soot Gremlins, Soot Sprites, Dust Bunnies, 
And you know, I'm a curious kitten, so I had to go down the Wikipedia rabbit hole to figure out why people had so many different names for them. And what I learned was really interesting. Initially, My Neighbor Totoro, the first movie that these creatures appear in, was available to English-speaking people only through a subtitled version. And in that version, they're referred to as black soots and soot spreaders. Later, in the English dubbed version that was created specifically for Japan Airlines, which I think is crazy, <laughs> for English-speaking people to watch to and from Japan while on airplanes. In this version, they were called soot sprites and dust bunnies. Then finally, in the Walt Disney adaptation and dubbing into English of the film, they were called soot gremlins. This is why we have so many different names for them. Something so fantastic about them is the immediate knowledge from all parties of what the girls are talking about. There's no negative attitude towards the girls seeing them. The dad immediately knows what they're talking about and has a very logical explanation for what they're seeing, and Granny does as well. Another fun thing with the soot sprites is that the little boy Kanta and the dad refer to the house as being haunted many times throughout the film, but not in a bad way, at least from the dad. The dad is excited and he says, I've always wanted to live in a haunted house, which is so fun and different from how we view spirits in Western culture. He is also excited to live in the area that reminds him of a time where people and trees were friends referring to a simpler time when people respected nature through their Shinto and animism beliefs. Animism is the belief that all things and creatures have a soul. I think the Shinto religion has a lot to do with this because they believe that spirits are everywhere all of the time and inhabit the world as we do. It's really interesting to think about it in Western culture. The idea of ghosts being scary because they're supposed to just be spirits of people, right? But ghosts and spirits have a very different meaning and place in culture in Japan. They're not seen as being scary most of the time. A similar attitude happens when Mei interacts with Totoro in the forest. She tells them what she sees, and when she first meets Totoro and his friends, walking through the meadow with their ears poking out of the grass, and follows them with childlike curiosity and wonderment. I can only imagine a kid in America seeing the same thing being terrified that it's a monster and running to tell their parents about it while hiding. But in the culture of kami and spirits in Japan and the respect that they have for them, she follows them in excitement. She follows the acorn trail that's left by Totoro's smaller blue friend and crawls through the tunnels of shrubbery in the forest to get to Totoro's hideout in the camphor tree. To me, Totoro is really scary in the first scene that we see him in, with his large, gaping mouth and his big roar. Honestly, it's pretty terrifying. But Mei isn't scared, because once again, it's just normal. It's happy and exciting to think that Mei has adopted the attitude in part from the teachings of her father. As we see in the scene in the bath, when Satsuki and Mei appear afraid of the wind and the storm, her dad teaches them to laugh and meet their fear with joy to make it go away. When Mei comes to her father and tells him what she's seen, her dad doesn't approach her with skepticism or shaming about telling tall tales. No, he comes with understanding and tells her that she must have been able to meet a forest spirit. How lucky is she? He then takes the girls through the Tori gate, up the stairs, and to the shrine to give the spirits a proper greeting. This is such a lovely example of the respect that's shown to the spirits in the Shinto religion. Something interesting about the creatures in My Neighbor Totoro is rather than in Spirited Away, where the majority of spirits are taken from Japanese folklore or heavily inspired by them, in this movie, Miyazaki created the spirits himself, including the soot sprites, the cat bus, and the Totoro creatures. They were all his own creation. They're inspired by folklore of forest spirits, However, he came up with the character designs completely on his own, and there aren't creatures in Japanese folklore that resemble them in appearance. There are some interesting differences between the English version and the Japanese version of My Neighbor Totoro. One funny difference is with the name Totoro itself. In the English version, they make it seem like the name comes from the growling noises that Totoro makes, and that Mei interprets that to be his name. The scene is the same in the Japanese version, but there's one caveat, that when Mei tells Satsuki about Totoro, she says, oh, do you mean the troll, or the Japanese word for troll, Tororu. 
because it sounds very similar to the word Totoro. She's referencing the book they've been reading, a book that's strikingly similar to the Billy Goat's Gruff, a tale of three goats that cross a bridge and have to interact with a troll, and the word that's used is the same, Tororu. We see the book at the end of the film during the end credits when mom is reading the book to the girls as a bedtime story. Another difference in the Japanese version is the scene where their mother is reading the letter from the girls, and Satsuki says, here is Mei as a crab in the English version, indicating that it's just a silly drawing that she made of her little sister for no reason other than to be cute and funny. However, in the Japanese version, she says Mei looks like a crab while she's sitting and waiting for her acorns to sprout. Not only does she look like a crab because of the way she's squatting at the ground and staring at the dirt, there's also a Japanese folktale about a little crab who plants seeds and waits for them to grow, and this is a reference to that as well. So I found the folktale online, and it's actually quite dark. It's about a monkey and a crab who find a rice dumpling and a persimmon seed. The monkey tricks the crab into taking the seed, and the crab plants it and waits for years for the persimmon tree to mature and grow big enough to bear fruit. In the end, once the tree has borne fruit, the crab asks the monkey for help to pick the fruit because the crab cannot climb the tree. And for literally no reason, the monkey climbs the tree, eats all the ripe fruit, and then just murders the poor crab by pelting unripe persimmons at his shell. In the end, the crab's son avenges his father's death and cuts off the monkey's head with his pinchers. It's crazy, and I cannot believe it's made for kids. Something really interesting that caught my attention while watching my neighbor Totoro and researching for this video was the scene that appears to be insignificant to someone else watching, but I think it's a powerful reminder of the cultural differences in medicine and nutrition in Western versus Eastern culture. Right before receiving the telegram about her mother's health and sending the girls into a tizzy, the girls are seen sitting under the shade of a tree with Granny, eating vegetables from her garden. Granny gives the girls a speech about how the vegetables are so good for them. They're full of vitamins and nutrients, and they should bring vegetables to their mother. She even says, if your mother eats the vegetables from my garden, I'm sure she'll get better. In Japanese culture and many other Eastern cultures, food is medicine, and it's seen as giving healing properties. If you ask someone from an Eastern culture what you should eat when you're sick, I guarantee you they will have a very specific idea of what food you should consume for the healing and nutrient properties. However, in the United States, we might tell you to eat chicken noodle soup from a can and drink Gatorade to make you feel better. It's just carbs and salt. No nutrients to be found. Let's talk about some important symbols in My Neighbor Totoro, including the cat. Cats in Japan are revered as symbols for good luck, and they're thought to bring about positive changes and have protective powers. It's for this reason that stray cats are treated with respect in Japan and are often cared for and fed by people in the neighborhood, even if they're not interested in keeping the cat as a pet. I'm sure you have seen the Japanese lucky cat or beckoning cat before. This symbol comes from a Japanese folktale of a lord who was seeking shelter under a tree during a storm, when he saw out of the corner of his eye a cat waving its paw at him, when suddenly a lightning bolt struck the exact place where he was standing before. The lord believed that his good fortune was because of the cat's actions, hence the beckoning hand became a symbol of good luck. In the film, the cat bus is indeed a symbol of good luck and protection, appearing just in the nick of time to help the girls out of a sticky situation more than once. The first time when they began to worry about how long their father was taking to return home at the bus stop, the cat bus appears to distract, preoccupy, and provide a moment of cheer and happiness in a bleak moment. Then later, when Satsuki, along with the rest of the community, is desperately searching for a lost May, the cat bus appears yet again to save the day. Speaking of the cat bus, did you know that there's actually a short sequel to My Neighbor Totoro called May and the Kitten Bus? It's actually so cute and lovely. It starts out with May playing in the yard with a mysterious wind that sweeps around her, a wind she remembers from the cat bus. She waits for the perfect moment, then traps the kitten bus inside her house. She befriends it and calms its fears by giving it a piece of her candy. 
And then the following night, the kitten bus comes to her window and wakes her up for a nighttime adventure. The kitten bus takes her flying through the air where we see many more cat buses all filled to the brim of Totoro's. They arrive in a forest where the kitten bus lets her out as all the cat buses are letting out the Totoro creatures when she spots her Totoro. She runs to him and gives him a big hug and snuggle, and then they go together to meet the big old grandma cat who is massive and turns into an airship. There's a funny moment here where Mei feeds the giant cat ship her candy and she loves it and she shows her affection by giving Mei a giant lick and Mei returns the favor. We never learn where all the Totoro creatures are heading off to though because the kitten bus returns Mei home safely before her family is any the wiser. Unfortunately, the only place to officially watch this 13 minute animated masterpiece is the Studio Ghibli Museum in Japan. I hope someday Studio Ghibli releases it to the public to be enjoyed, maybe in a special anniversary edition of My Neighbor Totoro. Some fan theories speculate that the cat bus is based off of a yokai from Japanese folklore called the Bakaneko, which is essentially a cat that gets really old and begins to develop supernatural powers. I don't think it really checks out though because in all of those tales, the yokai they transform into are walking on hind legs, and while they are shapeshifters, they're known for shifting into their former masters and other people, speaking various languages. A far cry from the voiceless mode of transportation we see in the cat bus. I think a much more likely inspiration for this fantastic cat creature could be the Cheshire Cat with his wide toothy grin. While you may think that the expression Cheshire Grin originated from Alice in Wonderland, it's actually been around in literature for a long time just to mean someone smiling with all their teeth and gums. The Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland also serves as a guide showing her the way in difficult times just like the cat bus. However, Miyazaki said in an anniversary DVD, I do like the Cheshire Cat, but there's no influence from it. When I had to come up with some kind of monster bus, I thought about a shape-shifting cat from Japanese folklore, so I just made a cat that shapeshifts into a bus, and that was that. So maybe the Bakaneko theories are true after all. Another symbol from Japanese symbology is the frog. I talked about this in my Spirited Away video also, and now seeing it again in this film, I'm more convinced that I'm right about it. In Japanese, the word for frog is the same as the word for return. Garu frogs are used as a symbol for safe return, and for this reason, small frog tokens are carried by travelers as a good luck charm for safe return home. So the fact that we see the frog croaking in the rain when dad returns safely home to the girls at the bus stop cannot be a coincidence. My Neighbor Totoro is one of the cornerstone Studio Ghibli movies and has since become the mascot for the film studio, which shows the pride that's been taken in this film. He can also be seen all over Japan, and there are even some Totoro statues at bus stops. And there are others like this one that have Totoro standees inside. The Studio Ghibli Museum has grown to be a large attraction and he's the main mascot throughout the park. Take a look at some of the attractions in the park. Totoro greets you in this cute little kiosk, and then there are some really good areas to take photos, like this scary Yubaba bridge. She looks so terrifying. And there's also a room that looks just like her office. You can also sit with no face on the train. There's also a special theater that screens 12 special short films that are only available in the Studio Ghibli Museum, like May and the Kitten Bus that looks just like the baby's room from Spirited Away. And in true Japan fashion, there's a cafe that serves food based on the beloved characters. Just look at these Totoro cream puffs. The cafe is called the Straw Hat Cafe, like Sophie's Hat and Hell's Moving Castle. There's also an exhibit where they unlock the secrets behind the delicious looking food in the Studio Ghibli films. Totoro is regarded in Japan and in many other countries, much like we regard a character like Winnie the Pooh or Mickey Mouse in the United States. And he's seen as cuddly, cute, and endearing by millions of people. I think that this is just due to the popularity of the film and that many children watched it as a child. But how beautiful is it to think that all of these people are enthralled by a creature that's the symbol of peace and being one with nature? I have officially come around to the charm of Totoro in the process of making this video, and the film and its characters have really grown on me, and I now understand the appeal completely. Well, there you have it. 
everything you ever needed to know about my neighbor Totoro and everything that makes it magical. If you want to help out my channel, the best way to do so is by watching another video and subscribing. I have video essays on Howl's Moving Castle and Spirited Away. If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for your time. I hope you do something today that makes you happy. See you later. Bye!